Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. Uh, had a few more uh, technical difficulties tonight, but we are up and running here. And as the title hopefully is telling you, uh, today I am going to take you through some games of the immortal Wilhelm Steinitz, uh, the first original world champion by MyMath. And uh, he had some really fun, really interesting games. So I wanted to warm up with uh, a little bit of a miniature against uh, Henry Edward Bird. Of course, Bird, famous for his opening, beginning with one F4. And uh, then we're going to dive into some rather complex games from the World Championship match between Johannes Zuckertorts and, of course, Wilhelm Steinitz. So hopefully you guys enjoy. Here we go. We have one E4 by Steinitz in this game. Uh, Bird replied with E6 d4, d5, entering the French. We have knight c3, and then bird just simply captures on e4. Of course, bishop b4 is a legal chess move as well. That has been tried by many, many people. Knight f6, also a pretty common move here, but d takes e4, by no means bad. We have knight takes e4 by Steinitz, and now we have the move knight f6. And uh, for those of you watching, I want to see if you guys at home can guess Steinitz's next move because I feel like, uh, of course, uh, the more experienced players in the chat will be a little bit more familiar with what's going on here and they'll know what the best move is. But if you're a little bit new to this sort of uh, this sort of dynamic between these two knights, you might not actually realize what the best move is here for white. It might be a little bit counterintuitive, so go ahead and think about it. Uh, what to do with the white pieces here. Yeah, Flash Gordon in the chat saying e6 was Bird's first mistake. You're not wrong. Not wrong. Uh, just take it from Anish Giri. The French is a difficult opening to get, a, to get a hold of. So yeah, I think a lot of uh, beginners and probably a lot of experienced chess players would play the move bishop g5 and bishop g5 is by no means a bad move it's been played plenty of times here and this is a perfectly fine position for white uh, however I do believe in this case that white's best move is actually to capture this knight on f6 and that's what was played in the game and uh, oftentimes we're told when we're sort of learning chess it's not so good to make these kinds of trades because they allow the opponent to sort of develop naturally, right? You spent your entire move taking this knight, black spent his entire move taking it back, but now what's this? He has one more piece out than white, which does tend to be sort of an unfortunate thing. Uh, of course, the exception is here because uh, we've drawn black's queen out. And not only have we drawn black's queen out, but very importantly, it's gone to a square where it can in fact be targeted. And that's what ends up winning Stein Steinitz this game. So, of course, white should continue development, but he wants to continue development with this queen in mind. If he doesn't actually target this queen, say he just plays bishop e2, knight f3, castles, bishop e3, then, in fact, knight takes f6 was uh, a little bit silly to draw the black queen out. But he wants to develop while keeping in mind this queen, so the move knight f3 comes on the board. Knight c6 was black's reply. And now, of course, what should white play here? What should white play here? Mm -mm. So, yeah, of course, the move to play now is bishop g5. Uh, developing with tempo, hitting the queen. And uh, this is where Steinitz really does start to take over uh, the entire game. Uh, I think at this point in time, black is close to lost already. It is rather rough, but uh, bird just moves the queen out of the way for now with queen to f5. And of course, now the, the very serious downside for black is that white is not done developing and can bring this bishop out to d3 as well, of course, with tempo. And now bird makes sort of his final mistake of the game. Uh, he had to play the queen over to d5, uh, or I guess queen a5 check is also playable, but queen d5 makes the most sense to me. Uh, just getting the queen to the centralized square and sort of out of harm's way 
at least for a few moments. Instead, he took a rather aggressive approach with queen to g4, uh, perhaps targeting the d-pawn, perhaps targeting the g-pawn as well. So if your name is Wilhelm Steinitz, how are you going to respond to queen g4? White to move and win the game. Uh, Manny says, was knight c6 a mistake? What's the modern reply to knight f3? So yeah, knight c6 was a pretty serious mistake. Uh, these days, this threat of bishop g5 is so severe that players often just play the move uh, h6 to stop bishop g5 directly. They often just play h6 to stop bishop g5 altogether. That's how powerful it is. So chat room, the queen's on g4. What to do? What can be done? Uh, all right, not gonna wait around for the delay. I'm sure some people already have the answer by the time they hear me say it. Of course, the move is h3. And this is a really interesting tactic. It's one that you'll see most often happen on the queen's side, right? The queen comes out to b6, hits b2, and oftentimes the way to trap this queen is to actually play the move a3. Uh, but on that side of the board, uh, let me just pull up a random position here. If I'm talented enough, of course this is all going to be nonsense. a3 takes, okay off, one more move, a3 takes, Oftentimes, when the queen captures on b2, the point is the a pawn takes away the final retreating square for the queen, and then the move knight a4 traps the queen. The rook defends the pawn very cleanly, the queen defends the rook, and the queen is just totally stuck. Everybody's seen this, this tactic uh, a billion times. However, what's the trick here? Well, after queen takes g2, which was played, of course, knight h4 is not going to get the job done here for multiple reasons. Number one, the g5 bishop would hang, and number two, the rook on h1 would hang as well. So what was Steinitz's point? What happens after h3? So yes, of course, we don't play the natural looking rook g1, which allows the queen to escape with queen takes h3. Uh, but instead, he plays the move rook to h2 instead, which does keep control of everything and trap this queen uh, entirely. Uh, and that, of course, was just the end of the game. Uh, Bird played a few more moves, takes h2, takes h2, takes on d4, and then the last move of the game, how did Steinitz uh, convince his opponent to resign? How does Steinitz convince his opponent to resign after knight to d4? Winning a queen wasn't enough. Bird is not convinced he should resign yet. You have to do better. Have to do better here. And so, of course, the last move of the game is bam, bishop b5 check, as you guys are saying. And the point now is that queen to d8 is going to be uh, a rather sad checkmate for Bird. Definitely not a good day for the namesake of 1f4 uh, here today. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that little uh, miniature there. Once again, uh, black's mistake. Uh, first of all, knight f6 really isn't so common these days because knight takes f6 is just a good move. And then even after knight f6, knight f3, black pretty much exclusively plays the move h6 here. Just you have to stop this bishop g5 idea. It's not good for black to have this queen be so vulnerable on the f6 square. Um, all right, with that, let's jump into the main uh, the main event here today. We have Zuckertort against Steinitz, and like a fool, I didn't label which round was which, but this is some round from their world championship match. And this one starts with the one move 1d4, one 1d5, one c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6. So of course we have the classic Queen's Gambit declined, and all three of our games from the World Championship uh, that we're looking at tonight are in fact going to be in this opening line. And we are going to see Zuckertort take three different approaches, and we're going to see all three of them sort of blow up in his face, uh, unfortunately for him. Uh, in the game, the move Bishop G5 was played, 
Of course, white can also go for the exchange uh, with c takes d5, and can also just play the, the calmer knight to f3. Uh, bishop g5, played in this game though, is one of the main variations. Bishop e7 is very, very natural for black, unpinning the knight, keeping good control of the d5 pawn. And now after knight f3, uh, developing normally, we see the move castles. And we are in very, very mainline theory. Uh, and now what made me want to go over this game first is white's next move here. Uh, so of course, uh, you know, white has plenty of options. e3, you know, developing this way, developing this way. It's still not too late to take on d5 if you really want. You can even play a nothing move like a3 if you really want in this position, although you should rather quickly defend this c4 pawn. So I, I, I think e3 is the best move, but really any of those moves are fine. Uh, instead, white takes a very, very ambitious approach here. White plays this move c5. And this is sort of something that I loved to do when I was uh, an up-and-coming youngster, uh, climbing my way up through that rating ladder. Uh, around, you know, 14, 1500, I was like, man, this c5 stuff, that's where it's at. That's how you win games with the white pieces. I just play c5, and then my opponents have no idea what to do. They have no space and uh, they, they just get sort of annihilated. Uh, unfortunately, Steinitz is, was a bit better than my opponents were uh, when I was sort of getting away with c5, and so he knows what to do against this. But I felt like it was really important to show this game because this idea can be really, really uncomfortable for black if black doesn't sort of strike back immediately. Uh, just as an example of sort of the uh, nightmare scenarios you could run into, if something like c6, which is not a bad move, uh, let's say uh, let's say knight e5, for example, uh, knight to d7, and something like f4 already, right? You can start to imagine how things could go could go wrong. Uh, let's say something like rook e8, just a nothing move, b4, a6, a3. All of a sudden, it's very clear, I just played like rook a7, uh, it's very clear none of black's pieces are going to be able to do anything. You know, someday black might uh, capture on e5 and try to play knight e4, but this is, is really not going to be uh, enough compensation for black here. Just all of these pieces sort of stuck behind their own pawns. And this is sort of the idea for, uh, for white in a lot of these cases. Maybe not so much allowing takes on e5, but sort of just taking a ton of space on the queen side and completely locking down the opponent. So what is the proper way to respond to c5? Well, what do you guys think in the chat room? Uh, what are some options for black to try and uh, fight back against pawn to c5? Mm -mm. So you guys already have the two main ideas. The, the two main ideas here. So of course... Uh, idea number one is the idea that was played in this game, and it is very often just the, the best way of responding to, uh, to this c5 idea, and it's to fight back with the move b6 and just immediately start fighting for these squares on the queen side. And it does turn out that this does tend to be a little bit more advantageous uh, to black, depending on how things go, uh, because... Uh, white is just a bit too overextended over here on the queen side. And I believe we're actually going to see black employ uh, a very important second idea a few moves later in, in the game. So b6 is a good start. b6 is a great way to start uh, attacking the pawn chain at, at its head, is what this is sort of called. You challenge the overextended c5 pawn, and of course white is not going to be interested in capturing opening up the A file, allowing black to capture towards the center, and gain good control uh, over the C5 square. So instead, white is pretty much forced into playing the move B4 to uh, just support this pawn even further. And now I want to ask you guys, uh, with black here, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, some people said they wanted to push with A5 rather immediately. Uh, is that what you want to do? Do you want to take on C5? Do you want to play C6? Do you want to do something else? What do you think? What do you think? Mm -mm. So, mm -mm. it does actually turn out 
that uh, I believe the best idea here for black is to actually just play this move a5, uh, just directly. And this is what a lot of people in the chat were saying, and from what I've seen, there's just really no reason to leave this pawn back on a7. You would want white to bring this pawn out to a3, and then you can take uh, sort of at your leisure. You don't necessarily want to take right away, oftentimes you shouldn't, uh, but it's good to have sort of this pawn here. And then after this, a move like knight e4 is, is probably just going to be very strong for black. For example, trades might occur. Uh, I think we can even take on c3 here. Uh, maybe we should just take here, though. Takes, takes. Knight e5, for example. And we can fracture white's pawns. We have sort of this tension that white can never release. And we have very active pieces uh, with this bishop on b7, and we'll develop the knight out uh, rather shortly uh, with knight d7. And black is just significantly better here. In the game, Steinitz took a more direct approach and just immediately captured on c5. And while Steinitz did go on to win this game, I do think this is a little bit of a misstep by black. This is one of those cases where white doesn't really ever have any options uh, to relieve the tension himself, right? You play the move a5, a3, even if you play a slow move like c6, uh, white is, like I said, never really going to be capturing either of these pawns. So because of that, you can sort of wait as long as you like in, uh, before capturing on either of these pawns, and white's never going to really be able to do anything about it. Uh, with all that in mind, though, after takes, uh, we do actually see uh, Zuckertort take back with the d-pawn. Now, perhaps... Uh, taking back with the B pawn would be a little bit better in light of black's next move after D takes C5. Of course, uh, Steinitz plays the very uh, familiar move A5 now. Uh, and A5 is, is just quite strong because white committed to taking this with the D pawn. And now the C pawn is going to be very, very weak if the B pawn should ever fall. Uh, and now we see white play the move A3. Uh, so black to move here. Black to move. You you can tell, based on opening principles alone, that white has sort of been violating some of them. He's making a ton of reactive pawn moves, trying to gain a ton of space early, early on, and he has neglected to develop his bishop and castle his king. So, of course, uh, what should you start looking for when your opponent has neglected to develop and castle? Uh, well, you should start looking for ways to open things up and get at the white king. So what's the best way to do that here? What's the best way to open things up and start pushing towards that king? Knight c6 has been suggested. Knight e4 has been suggested. We'll talk about those in a, in a little bit. So no one has suggested uh, the winning move just yet, believe it or not. Working with a little bit more delay than normal tonight, so forgive me if I'm slow on the responses here. Yeah, no one has quite the right idea. You guys are looking for, you know, solid positional moves, but uh, Black actually has some, some nice tactics at his disposal. Not necessarily tactics to win material directly, but uh, tactics that allow him to play moves he, he maybe otherwise couldn't. So there are plenty of, of fine developing moves that you can play, but now I actually do see the, the correct move in the chat here. Uh, Black can actually just play this move d4 very, very directly. Uh, you don't need to prepare it with knight c6, you don't need to prepare it with, with anything else, you can just play the move d4. Uh, now, of course, if knight takes d4, what is this tactic that I'm talking about? Well, it's this tension that black has on the queen side. As I said, black can always wait to take on b4 until it's under very favorable circumstances, and after knight takes d4, those circumstances have finally arrived. a takes b4, and capturing back is not possible due to the weakness on d4 of this knight. And, of course, this is going to be very winning for black if he can take a3, as all of white's once glorious queenside pawns start to collapse. 
Uh, now, if you do play a move like knight c6, you do have to be a little bit careful, I think, because b5 could sort of ruin your day. Uh, I think you can still get away with playing knight a7 here, and too many of black's pawns are, are hanging uh, for comfort. But you have to be very, very careful, uh, because stuff like c6 can really start to come. And... Uh, yeah, if, if you let white play the move a4, then all of a sudden I think black is in pretty serious trouble here. So you do have to be a bit cautious. Moves like h6 are, are perfectly fine as well, and knight e4 definitely isn't a bad move, but it's not sort of that that uh, winning attack on the king that I was looking for. Because of course here, uh, simply trading uh, the queens is going to be possible for, um, uh, for white here. And you can play something like knight uh, knight e5 i think you do win the b pawn here uh which should be enough to win the game but you're not really checkmating the white king which is what we're looking for so the move d4 is a great winning move to start uh forcing back the white pieces and to start getting closer and closer to attacking this uncastled king uh now zukertort chose the move bishop takes f6 here and steinitz makes a pretty interesting decision uh, bishop takes f6 was fine, but he wanted to keep pressure up on the c5 pawn, I think, and he actually recaptures with the g pawn, which is uh, perfectly fine here for black, of course. Uh, the same issue uh, sort of persists if you try to take this pawn. You take with the queen, uh, black can take first, and then take, a, take on b4, don't know if I mentioned. Uh, and so now white plays the move knight to a4. Uh, and now the move that I was talking about uh, a long time ago does finally come on the board. Black just plays the move e5. And what we have here is a classic case of black taking over the center because white started pushing on the wing. This is sort of one of the uh, all-time great examples of countering an attack on the flank with an attack in the center. And Steinitz did it very, very well in the opening, and we'll see now that he does manage to convert it into the full point with even more uh, sort of astounding accuracy. And e5, a long time ago, uh, way back here when we were discussing options for black, uh, e5 is sort of the secondary idea that black has at his disposal to fight against this move c5. Why is that? Well, b6 attacks the pawn at the head of the pawn chain, but as I think Manny was mentioning in the chat, you can try something like knight c6. And uh, if I give a, a move or two to black here, let's say bishop d3, something like e... Well, okay, I can't hang this guy, so maybe another move for black. Uh, something like e5 is going to be good for black. Countering an attack on the flank with an attack in the center. White is really unable to capture. Well, I guess white can capture, but now the point is... Uh, this pawn is going to be very, very weak without the d4 pawn to support it. So that was another, another idea that I just wanted to mention. Of course, though, b6 in this case is quite good for black. So we have takes, takes, and now e5. Uh, white uh, sort of desperately goes for, uh, goes for b5 here, trying to make his queenside pawns at least useful. And black just takes this opportunity to develop the bishop out to e6, and like I said, is sort of just completely crushing. Uh, the move g3 comes on the board. White does also now finally try to develop his king side. And c6 comes by black just totally neutralizing all of the threats on the queen side of the board. Uh, white would love to play the move a or would love to play the move b6. But I think here uh, what do I think here? I think knight a6 is going to be plenty to sort of recoup this pawn. Uh, if you play the move rook c1, queen d5, and it is getting very, very difficult to, uh, to keep up with the threats to this pawn. If queen c2, queen b3 even, and all of the white pieces are starting to lose their grip on the, uh, on the pawn. For example, if bishop g2, you can take here, play bishop b3. And things are busted for white. So instead of b6, Zukertort tries the move b takes c6, and we get knight takes c6 in response. Uh, bishop g2 by Zukertort is very, very uh, natural. And now Steinitz plays the move rook b8, uh, just stepping off of this uh, long open diagonal. Uh, to follow it up, we see white play the move uh, queen to c1. Uh, of course, rook b8 also, sorry, 
was coming with the threat of bishop b3. So that's why we see queen c1 by white, stepping out of this threat, uh, which would have won a knight. So now with black, you know, the, the moment of truth is here. You've gotten all your pieces out, and your opponent still is uh, uncastled in the center of the board. So how do you make use of your central pawns here? What can you do to actually win the game? So yeah, Manny has the uh, the right idea here. You just push this move uh, d3, and White is sort of uh, sort of busted, sort of just busted. If White tries to take on d3, then I think Black would simply recapture on d3. And now, sort of, no matter what happens, uh, if Queen d1, for example, you're running back into this fork. If something like Queen B, well, queen b1 can't be played. There's really no way to contest this queen. Bishop f1 hangs a knight. Queen d1, like I said, also hangs a knight. And this queen is just uncontested. If you play rook a2, you, you can't. That square is defended and rook b1 hangs. If you play knight d2, for example, knight d4 is going to come. And really, white is just left without a way to, uh, to get back into this game. If queen c3, this actually also hangs a knight. There's really no way to contest this queen. So d3 is the killer move. Uh, Zuckertort chooses the move e3 instead to try to keep everything locked down. And now the simple choice of e4 by Steinitz. And this space is a bit too cramped for, uh, for white. Knight d2 comes on the board, and now f5, just defending the center. White finally gets kingside castles kingside castled, but notably, he didn't get to do so for free, right? While we didn't succeed in checkmating this king in the center of the board, it did allow us to get this pawn all the way to d3, and white was unable to trade it off for the e-pawn, thanks to the weakness of that king. So this is the big benefit that, uh, that black got out of pushing this pawn so far up the board. Black plays... Uh, a pretty interesting move here, rook to e8, which on the surface doesn't make a ton of sense, right? It's just a, a random rook move, but you might see in a few turns that black had a, a pretty killer idea with it in mind. And now uh, white plays the move f3, and this sort of had to be done, right? White has to challenge these central pawns for black, or else he's just going to lose the game. And now finally, you guys, the moment has come, black to move and win the chess game, just very definitively win the chess game here. Mm -mm. What you guys got? What you guys got? Your opponent played f3. If you don't find this move, your center might start to collapse. Might start to collapse. Okay, so um, I'm not going to lie to you guys here. There is more than one winning move, I think, in this position. Uh, black is pretty crushing, but this one, once you find it, there's really no need to look for, for other moves. And yeah, you guys have it here. Uh, Aryan and Manny, uh, all with the correct answer. Uh, knight to d4 is the crushing idea. And what's the point? Well, the point is this e3 pawn is all that's stopping black from uh, getting everything to glory, right? Getting all these pawns to glory. You might be thinking, ah, yeah, knight d4, it's very clever. If he takes, I can take back and pick up the knight on a4. If that's what you were thinking, congratulations on finding the fun move knight d4. We're not interested in taking this knight, though. This knight is, is worthless to us. We're interested in queening these pawns. Uh, of course, black or sorry, white does sort of have to capture here. If he tries something like uh, king to h1, uh, stepping out of the fork, uh, I think. Uh, I mean, I think everything wins. But if I had to put a move on the board, I would say knight e2 is pretty good. Yeah, let's say knight e2, queen e1, and now we can even just take here, 
and follow up with bishop g5. And our knight in the middle of the board, or sorry, in the middle of the white camp is going to be sort of devastating. We can also put the knight on c2 if we want, and this is also quite good. We can also put the knight on b3 if we want, it's also quite good. Just put the knight anywhere, and you sort of win the game. Uh, white was up to the task, though, and did try capturing on d4. Of course, takes back with check. Uh, king h1. And now, like I said, we're not really interested in taking this knight on a4, when white could start to capture our stuff back in the center, but rather the move e3 is sort of just devastating here. Uh, knight c3 was white's attempt to try to get back into the game, and now bishop f6 is a nice follow-up, all of the black pieces working together very, very well. And you can see that this rook on e8 is now well placed with the freedom of movement that the e-pawn has. Uh, knight uh, d to b1 was played, the simple move d2, queen c2, bishop b3 now, just getting the queen out of there, the f5 pawn means nothing. Uh, queen takes f5, and now black goes ahead and queens his first pawn. We see takes takes, knight c3, e2, rook a takes d1, and after queen takes c3, uh, Zukertort resigned the game with both of his rooks uh, unfortunately hanging in the position. And uh, yeah, like I said, I wanted to go over this game because of white's choice in this opening to play the move c5. Uh, it's something that was uh, always very attractive to me as I was uh, learning chess more and more at the club level. And once you see this game, uh, I, I think it's hard to convince yourself to play the move c5 with white ever again. It's just such a disaster what happened to Zugertort in this world championship uh, in this world championship game. So once again, let's take a, a quick look at all of the highlights here. So. White chooses this move c5, black immediately strikes back with b6, not taking a slower approach, which is good. b4, and takes on c5 isn't totally necessary, but it's fine for black. And now a5 is good for black once again, white needed to capture back with the b-pawn, when once again, black can start looking for ideas of pushing the move e5. And now a5 is good, d4, taking advantage of the opponent's king position and the tactics available to black on the queen side. Uh, knight over to a4, now e5, and finally we see this move, uh, rook b8 making a threat, and d3 to uh, take advantage of the opponent's king position for one more move. And of course, the nice breakthrough, knight d4. And uh, I want to give you guys a little bit of a spoiler here. If you think knight d4 looks like a really, really cool move, you're definitely going to want to stick around for the end game class right after this when I'm going to be showing you guys a ton of tactics that all revolve around this theme of breaking through in end games, of getting uh, blockers out of the way so that you can start to queen pawns. So knight d4, this idea showing up not in an end game in this case, but in a middle game, uh, allowing Steinitz to just sort of destroy Zuckertort in this game. Uh, with all that in mind, let's move along. Could I point out the important difference of the bishop f4 line where white also plays c4, c5? So yeah, um, there's a few differences there. Let's take a look. Let's see if I can actually even remember it here. Uh, let's say bishop f4, e3, castles, uh, knight f3 I want to say, knight bd7, c5, right? Okay, so the, the differences here is, first of all, black has already committed this knight to d7, so if black, if black plays the move b6, now all of a sudden c6 is a very legitimate option that wasn't before. Uh, also, he's going to have to worry about this move to follow, so black has to take a little bit of extra time to play the move c6. After bishop d3, b6, b4. Now, of course, we're always taking this guy with the, with the b-pawn. And here... Uh, the, the key difference is white is pretty much totally developed, right? White is totally developed, and knight e4 tactics, which were sometimes strong in the game that we looked at with the bishop on g5 always being attacked, they're really not going to work quite as well with white well, uh, well prepared to, uh, to face it. Uh, that being said, this line isn't bad for black at all either. Uh, he does get the bishop out through, through a6. Uh, another key point that I want to mention, of course, is on f4. White is keeping good control over the e5 square, which, as I said, is the other important break for black in the position, whereas with on the bishop on g5, the e5 ideas really do uh, gain quite
quite a bit in strength. So uh, basically, this is just a much, much better version of the same for white here. Now, of course, though, this line is playable, whereas the other line is sort of just awful for, uh, for white. Good question, though. Good question. Mm -mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, funny stuff in the chat. It can also be played in the Panov. So, yes, that's true. It can be played in the Panov. You're, you guys are really asking a lot of my opening theory uh, knowledge here. In the Panov, it's a bit different without the E pawn. Uh, once again, it's just subtle differences. And I'm trying to remember the exact pawn structure. It's, it's just a different pawn structure, right? It's just a slightly different pawn structure. If I can sort of navigate my way out to the position, let's say e6, c5 or something. Yeah, uh, it's, it's just a different structure. Here, of course, the c pawn is actually passed. There's no counter c pawn for black. Black has already committed to the move e6, so he's not playing e5 in one tempo. And yeah, you're going to find this idea of c5 arrive in some positions, but generally black is always going to be okay if he can get this counterplay in time with b6 and a5 and the move e5. But yeah, it is playable in some positions. I don't mean to say that it's always, always, always a bad move. Uh, just that... It, it is more the exception that c5 is a good move than, than the rule. Generally, c5 just allows black some quick counterplay, but you will find it in some opening lines. All right, with all that in mind, let's go ahead and move on here to another game. So this, of course, is still Zuckertort Steinitz, and in this game, we'll see Zuckertort has sort of reformed his ways here. Actually, no, this is the game I want to go over last, so we'll go for, uh, go for this one instead. We have the same opening, though. And here, actually, rather than even get the chance to play the move c5, which I kind of doubt Zuckertort would want to do, we instead see the move d takes c4 by black, which is just a different uh, different line. It's still totally fine. Uh, e3 now for white, and black immediately strikes back in the center with the move c5. Uh, and this is more or less an attempt for black to equalize straight out of the opening whenever you see black do this. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that generally in a lot of positions, white is going to be the one ending up with a little bit of extra space uh, in the center, thanks to his opening play, uh, moving two pawns to the fourth rank directly, and black is going to have to struggle to catch up, play c6, maybe play c5 later, maybe play e5 later, maybe we just have an exchange on d5. But when black takes on c4 like this and plays c5, Black is just saying, yeah, all right, I'm trading my DNC pawns for your DNC pawns, and then you'll have no reason to be better. Because uh, he won't have any extra space. In the game, though, we see bishop takes c4, and now after c takes d4, e takes d4, we have the dreaded IQP. So let's see uh, how this IQP turns out here for Zuckertort Steinitz. Um, and I do want to briefly mention that if you're ever looking to see uh, at a reasonably high level these opening ideas like the IQP, like white playing in an early C5, uh, these other early ideas that don't see play at the top level anymore, if you want to see them played and sort of battled out in high level games, uh, this world championship match is definitely the one for you because back then they had no idea if this was good or bad You know, they didn't have computers. They didn't have, you know, centuries of, of work to go off of and so they, they sort of just played things and and worked it out over the board and so we'll see now uh, What blacks play was like against the IQP here uh, bishop e7 of course is very natural just getting developed uh, Sort of in advance breaking any pins here keeping everything solid we see castles and castles. Uh, white plays the move queen e2, which looks a little bit strange at first glance, but uh, it has some pretty dangerous attacking ideas with some chances to sacrifice on e6 if black gets a little bit careless and maybe brings the bishop out this way. It also allows the rook to step to d1 to support the d-pawn from behind, and on a very, very good day, you might see a, might see a checkmate occur. Uh, knight b to d7 was Steinitz's choice. So why do you think Steinitz chose the move knight, d, knight b to d7 uh, over the move knight c6? 
white knight b to d7 here. So yeah, IQP, of course, standing for the isolated uh, queen's pawn. The pawn on the queen's starting file when it is isolated. IQP. So white knight bd7, well of course it is all about the d5 square, right? So Steinitz plays the move knight b to d7, uh, even though it looks a little bit more awkward than knight c6, which would pressure the d pawn, because he simply wants to go knight b6 and knight d5. It's, it's as simple as that. It's not some you know deep complex strategy, it's just against the IQP, it's very very important to to control the square in front of the pawn. A lot of times, much more so than trying to pressure the pawn directly. You just want to make sure that pawn can't advance and sort of ruin your day. Uh, that being said, knight c6 isn't necessarily a bad move at all. Why is that? Well, because unless white plays the move a3, which he can't here because the pawn is hanging, so rook d1, he can go with the same idea of playing knight b4, and once again, you are going to see the knight land on the d5 square. But knight b to d7 uh, oftentimes is a more natural way of getting there because knight c6 doesn't always come with tempo, right? Sometimes white does have time to play a3 here, and if so, then this knight might not be the happiest on c6. It might have to try to come back to e7 to get to d5, and like I said, just might not always be the happiest. So knight b to d7 is sort of a surefire way of getting to d5. Uh, bishop b3 was played in the game, actually anticipating black's next move of knight b6. And now bishop f4. Black simply takes control of the d5 square and plants a knight on that square with uh, little controversy. Of course, the knight on d5 is pressuring the bishop on f4. Also, of course, when you do have the isolated queen's pawn yourself, you want to avoid trading a ton of minor pieces uh, because they're, uh, they're sort of the ammunition that you need to launch some kind of an attack, right? You wanna put this knight on e5 using your extra space. You wanna put some pressure on the h7 pawn using this bishop. And with this knight, sometimes you can even jump into e4 to uh, start removing some defenders. So uh, white wanting to avoid minor piece trades plays the move bishop g3, which is perfectly natural. Uh, now black plays a pretty interesting move here. He plays the move queen a5, and I, I kind of like this move. Uh, Oftentimes in these kinds of openings for black, the queen just ends up sort of in the way, right? This bishop's taking away the c7 square, the d6 square. Uh, the c file is open, so c7 isn't that comfortable anyways. And it makes a lot of sense to get the queen out of the way along with, uh, along with pressuring this knight on c3. Uh, the rook comes a to c1. And now Steinitz uh, manages to develop his bishop with the move bishop d7. And this might be an idea a lot of you aren't as familiar with these days. Uh, I think Steinitz was sort of known for developing his bishop in this manner uh, quite a bit. Nowadays, I think a lot more common, uh, top players really, really strive to get the bishop out along this diagonal. Uh, but we'll see that there is actually definite benefits to, to not getting it out along this diagonal and playing bishop d7. So many of you probably think, well, why is this bishop going to d7? Well, of course, it's heading for c6, and you would actually be a bit wrong there. So uh, Steinitz's idea in this case was that white has made a weakness by isolating this pawn on d4. So all the pressure's on white. White has to make something happen here. And if white doesn't make something happen, then he's just going to be saddled with this weakness in, in the long run. So with all that in mind, after knight e5, which is natural, rook to d8, of course, once again, white isn't so interested in this minor piece trade. We saw the move queen f3, and now the bishop doesn't step to c6, but rather steps back to e8. And what we see now is a very, you know, sort of conservative approach from black, uh, most of his pieces sitting on the first three ranks here, but a very solid approach, and all of his pieces are working together very harmoniously. Uh, he has good control over d5 with uh, his rook, his queen, and his knights. He has good control over the weak f7 square by this bishop on e8. And white is sort of left uh, feeling a bit helpless, uh, feeling like there isn't too much to be done here. And that turns out to be exactly the case. 
So this bishop d7 to e8 maneuver is definitely not ridiculous, and so I think this is a good one to, uh, to keep in mind here. Not always getting the bishop out to the most active square, but bishops serving a good defensive role can be good pieces as well. Uh, rook f to e1 was played in the game, and now rook a to c8. Uh, here, Zuckertort really did feel the need to try and drum something up, and so he plays the move bishop h4. Uh, bishop h4, of course, now pressuring this knight on f6, so indirectly pressuring this knight on d5. And uh, now I want to ask you guys a question, right? So the move knight takes c3 is definitely playable here for black. So let's say if you take on c3 and your opponent takes back with the b pawn. Are you guys happy about that change in structure? Are you happy to draw uh, white's pawn to the c3 square or not? And why? Mm -mm. And why? So nobody's happy about this change in structure. Everybody hates it. That's what the chat room seems to uh, have decided on. And uh, in general, uh, I will say that it is very, very tempting to try and get you know this perfect scenario where the IQP remains isolated for the rest of eternity, and uh, you just trade off all the pieces, and then you're in some great endgame, and you just win the isolated queen pawn, right? Unfortunately, the reality of that is a little bit messier, and uh, I will say that, at least myself personally, in most of my games where I'm playing against the IQP, at one point or another, I, I do end up taking this knight on c3. And even though after b takes c3, uh, white is supporting the d4 pawn a bit more solidly, in the long run, white is still going to have a, a lot of weaknesses to contend with. Uh, for example, now, c3 is a definite weakness, and we'll see a little bit later in the game, white pushes this pawn to c4, but then he always has to keep track of not one, but, but both pawns. Uh, the obvious downside to this is with this pawn coming to c4, uh, white sort of has twice as many threats, threatening the step to d5 with a little more support, and also threatening the step to, uh, to c5 as well. So definitely there are upsides and downsides to this. Uh, the major upside, and why it was played in the game, is it does, for the moment, alleviate the pressure on d5, right? We took off this knight on c3, which was very uncomfortably uh, applying this pressure to the d5 square. Black now retreats this queen all the way back to c7, thanks to the c file being closed, and thanks to this bishop no longer occupying the g3 square. Uh, notably also, he is unpinning his knight with this move. Uh, queen d3 was the next move in the game, trying to support both pawns from behind with the queen. And once again, we see the move knight d5. As I said before, black is always, always, always looking for opportunities to trade off some minor pieces against uh, both the IQP and now what's called sort of the hanging pawn structure with these two pawns uh, isolated from the rest of the group, but still connected. And so we do see bishop takes e e7, queen takes e7, and then white actually captures on the d5 square. And I do think that this is uh, a little bit of a positional mistake. Uh, white could try to play the move c4, and while this knight does get active, stepping to b4 and back to c6, I think uh, it, it is a bit better for white in this case to follow those principles and uh, understand that keeping minor pieces on is going to be the, the way to go here for him. Instead, though, we did see bishop takes, and now after rook takes, c4, and rook d to d8. Uh, unfortunately for white, while he does have now these very, very active pawns, uh, he's traded off a bit too, a few too many pieces in order to uh, attain this position. And I do think I would actually rather be black in this specific scenario. 
Objectively, I think the evaluation is, is still probably really close to equal, but practically, I do think it is black here who uh, has a little bit less pressure on him. Whenever you get these structures with white, you're always under a lot of pressure to make something happen, to push d5, to get the breakthrough, uh, and a lot of the time it's it's just not going to be there for not going to be there for you. Uh, white plays the move rook to e3, and black very naturally just attacks the d4 pawn again. Now we see the move rook to d1, and all of a sudden this bishop, which is looking so so silly all game long, is starting to get a little bit of scope after the move f6. Right, this knight on e5 is was not going to stay there forever. And I think this move f6 is what definitively allows me to say that bishop takes d5 was a mistake. Once these minor pieces start disappearing from the board, black has all this freedom to start taking back some squares with weakening moves like f6, because there just simply aren't the pieces on the board for white to take advantage. Uh, white plays a nice little intermezzo here of rook h3 with the threat of checkmates. Uh, black responds rather simply with the move h6. Uh, knight g6 might look tempting by the way, but it doesn't actually achieve a whole lot, so white drops the knight back to g4 instead. We see queen f4, and now knight e3. And finally, 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 we have all of black's pieces serving uh, a nice attacking role besides the bishop, but we can fix that with black's next move, bishop a4. Uh, white plays another intermezzo of rook f3, queen back to d6. Rook d2 is now forced to keep control over the d4 pawn. And now the simple move, bishop c6, gets played. Rook g3. And now another fun move by black here, f5, is the move to take some more central space, allowing for this bishop to come out to e4. Uh, rook g6 makes a threat to the f5 pawn, but now bishop e4. Queen b3, king h7, and these pieces uh, do start to get uh, a little bit evicted here. And finally now, I believe uh, white is uh, just actually busted. Sorry, king h7 is defending this rook. I thought white's losing move like came next, but it does turn out that white's losing move is in fact going to be this move, rook g6. Um, already here though, I would say once again, I would definitely prefer black with all this pressure to the white pawns in the center. But yeah, rook g6 does turn out to be the losing move thanks to bishop e4 and king h7 when this rook is totally trapped. Uh, white tried this move c5, but tactically this doesn't quite turn out to work. So black to move and win in this position. Uh, give me a, a little bit of a sequence here. Try not to just uh, give me the first move. The first move is not so difficult to find, but finding uh, a little bit of a sequence is uh, slightly more interesting. Did Zugertort win any games in this match? Uh, yes, he did. I don't actually remember the final score, but uh, Zucretor did win a, win a few games off of Steinitz. So yeah, Manny actually saw the tactic uh, coming in advance here. Uh, with this pin on the C file, yes, Rook takes C5 is the, the playable move here. Of course, though, the, the line doesn't end there, right? White has this move rook takes e6, and now the move rook c1 check comes on the board. And white is going to be a little bit uh, uh, hard-pressed to find a suitable reply to this. Uh, he tried the move knight d1, but now, after queen f4, all of black's pieces are, are coming into the game, and uh, and yeah, white is just, just busted. Queen b2, rook b1 forces the queen away, Queen c3, and now once again, can you guys find, uh, well I guess technically the second to last move of the game here for black. Rook c5 was a nice start, but this is the beautiful finish. Mm -hmm. 
The beautiful finish here, chat room. What do you see? What do you not see? Yeah, go ahead and ask me whatever you want to ask, Sharma. Mm -mm. The killer move is queen g4, bishop takes g2. You guys aren't there just yet. You guys aren't there just yet. I think those moves probably win. Yeah, all the moves probably win. Queen g4, maybe there's f3. I don't know. It looks a bit awkward. But uh, yeah, chess king has the answer here. The beautiful move is rook c8, and this is the move that puts Zuckertort out of the game. Of course, this rook cannot be captured because of queen takes d2 with checkmate to follow. Uh, if you try something like queen e3, I think now the simplest is to go rook c to c1 anyways. Queen takes f4, gets met with checkmate, and there's simply no way to defend this knight. In the actual game, rook takes e4 was played, queen takes e4 was played, and Zuckertort resigned here. Now, of course, this cannot be captured due to the threat of checkmates. And that is just about going to do it for us here on the road to 2000. Uh, does anybody have any questions about this game before we call it quits and move on to the end game class? <clears throat> any questions for me here? So yeah, not queen g4, rather, but rook c8, bringing the final piece into the attack, is the tactic to end this game. <laughs> yeah, Manny saw this back rank mate coming about 20 moves in advance. Well done, well done. All right, yeah, just waiting for the delay to catch up here. It looks like we don't have too many questions, so I am going to call it quits here for the Road to 2000. Be sure to stick around. We do have the end game class uh, coming up right next. And as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, it's going to be a pretty fun one tonight. I have a ton of end game tactics for you guys, which isn't something that we do every week, but uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Going to be a lot of fun. Uh, what is a good book for 2200 players? Uh, you, you tell me. Um, I'm around 2200, and these days, normally the books I'm reading uh, tend to be opening books. That's what I find to be the most useful, but... How can I improve as an 1800 player? These questions are too general. I meant about the chess game. I meant about the chess game. Yeah, general improvement, uh, obviously it's, it's different for everybody, but as always, just keep playing chess, keep doing what you're enjoying, and uh, the rating points will come in the long run. That's always been my philosophy. Um, all right, I am going to call it there. Thank you guys so much for joining me here on the Road to 2000. Of course, be sure to join me right after this for the endgame class. Uh, thank